what a day this is. Not only can I see the screen, but I opened my communion cup. <laughs> all, all by myself. The wafer and the juice. It's wow. Hey, I don't know. Absolutely. Usually I need help with some part of that. <laughs> Hey, today I would like to talk to us from Luke chapter 5. So if you want to follow along in your Bibles or your Bible apps, that's where we're going to go. We're going to go to Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5, we read a story from the life of Jesus, and it is a great, great story. I think one of the tests of a great story is that when you read it or you hear it told, you think, man, what would it have been like to be there when that happened? Or, man, I wish I could have been there for that. I think another test of a great story is you find yourself identifying with a character in the story. Something moves you and you identify with the character that moved you. So a great story makes you think, uh, you know, I wish I could have been there for that. And it makes you think, who am I in this narrative? And this story we'll look at today takes place in a small town called Capernaum. And that town, Capernaum, is the Apostle Peter's hometown. It's where Peter grew up with his buddies. I don't know, maybe they all hunted and fished together. I'm sure they fished together. That, that was supposed to be a little bit funny. <laughs> Cause, cause, I'll explain it to you, because we know Peter was a fish. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Got it. Got it. In Luke 5, they're in Peter's hometown, and you can certainly make the argument that this whole story takes place in Peter's house. We don't know that for sure, but it is likely. So picture the scene, this little country town, a lot of pickup trucks out there in the driveway, but there's a lot of other guests that are at the house this day, and, and they're not locals. They've come from out of town, the bigger areas, and they're the religious leaders, and they have come to investigate Jesus. Many there that day are not seekers, they are skeptics. But they're there, and they've come to kind of, well, check out Jesus. See, in the previous story of Luke chapter 5, Jesus had just healed a leper. And healing a leper was something that just didn't happen. In fact, there's no record of a leper being healed from the time of the Mosaic Law up until now. There is absolutely no record of that ever happening. And this healing of the leper is a big deal because some of the religious leaders taught that there were three miracles that you would look for to know when the Messiah had come. And one of the miracles they said was that he would heal a leper. So Jesus has healed this leper, and they can't imagine that this guy is the Messiah. This unconventional rabbi with this ragtag group of disciples who just a few months earlier had been a carpenter, they didn't make, didn't make sense to the religious leaders that this was Messiah. So they were there to check him out, to investigate. And they all gathered and crowded into this house in this small town. And so here is this great and wonderful story. Let's pick up in Luke chapter 5 and verses 17 to 19. One day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men came carrying a paralytic man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up to the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd right in front of Jesus. Now, if you heard this story before, there's a sense where you say, yeah, that's what I would have done too. Let me tell you, no, that's not what we would have done because it was kind of insane. They go up on the roof and they tear a hole in the roof. In hindsight, we think, well, of course, because we know who Jesus is. But they weren't so sure. This was all new to them. And they make this incredible decision that they're going to do whatever it takes to get their friend to Jesus. And so, what would it have been like to be there? 
there's this packed house and not surprisingly many have moved up to the front to hear the teacher but for the most part it's standing room only and the crowd is spilling out the doors and everyone is leaning in trying to hear what jesus has to say the pharisees so that they could accuse him verse 18 tells us some friends carrying a paralyzed man on a mat were trying to get him to jesus Gospel of Mark tells us that there were four men, four friends bringing their friends who was paralyzed. Now we don't know a lot about them, but we do know what it was like to be a paralytic in that day. It was basically a death sentence. There were no wheelchairs, there were no assistance programs. Unless you had a crew of people that you could depend on for everything, you didn't have much of a chance unless you had this kind of ride or die group around you, it just wasn't, there wasn't much hope for your life. I find when I was preparing for this, that it just stopped me in my tracks because that's us. When we need prayer, when we need someone to get us to Jesus, that's us. So you got these four friends that seem to be with this man. I don't know what caused them to take the friend to Jesus. My guess is maybe one of them was on the scene when Jesus healed the leper, or at least knew about it. When he saw it, he immediately thought of his buddy, and he ran to get him. And I don't know how the man who was paralyzed would have felt about this little field trip. Chances are he had tried a whole bunch of things before. Lots of times I'm sure he got his hopes up, and he probably didn't want to be disappointed again. Besides, I think maybe he didn't want to ask his friends to do this after they all the things they already do for him. And he certainly would have avoided public places, because the religious people of the day would have made him think that it was something that he did wrong, or something that his parents did wrong that caused his condition. There was a lot of judgment. And you certainly would have avoided big crowds, especially religious crowds, because that would make them think that God doesn't really like you very much. Or maybe he doesn't like your parents because it might have been their fault that you're in this condition. I can't imagine he was initially excited about it. But remember, he's with this group of guys, and they're saying, hey, we're going, and you're coming. You're going. And so they grab him and his mat, and they are on their way. And when they get there, the crowd doesn't seem to be helpful in allowing them to get their friend to Jesus. Maybe nowadays they would have kind of like crowd surfed him in. You ever see a concert where they, they crowd surf people? Maybe they could have tried that today. In fact, the Greek word here indicates that they tried hard. The verb indicates they tried hard, that they were trying and trying to find a way. But the doors were blocked, the windows were blocked, crowds spilled out all over, and then one of them gets an idea. Hey, let's go up on the roof. What are we gonna do up there? I'm sure the other guys ask. We're gonna tear a hole in the roof. And what I think we might be dealing with here is really Philadelphia Eagle fans. Because it seems like the Eagle fan, that's like an Eagle fan thing to do. Some crazy fanatical reason that's taken place in the story at this point. Now, anybody remember when the Eagles won the Super Bowl? I know it was decades ago. Okay, Tom, <laughs> not quite decades, but the fans were firing off guns and climbing flagpoles and setting things on fire. We're going to do it. Yeah, Eagles, let's go. You need evidence. I just gave you evidence why I think they may have been Eagles fans. So they decide, we're going up on the roof. And this is the part of the story where I just think of myself in this story. I got to tell you, I don't want to be the religious leaders standing in front with their arms crossed, looking for a reason to accuse. I really want to be one of the friends, minus the Eagles fan part. I want to be one of the friends. Maybe the one who had the idea in the first place. 
I want to be one of the guys who brings their buddy to Jesus no matter what it takes. Maybe a bunch of those redneck boys doing what, what was the right thing to do for their friend with faith and hope. They didn't have any spiritual pedigree. They didn't follow any of the rules of etiquette. The one thing that mattered to them was that they got their friend to Jesus. And they were going to do it, whatever it took, to make it happen. So they decide, we're going up on the roof. And the plan is, we're going to tear a hole in the roof. But it's a pretty nice roof. Pretty nice roof here, too. Unlike some of the roofs of the day, these roofs were made of tiles. So it involved some digging. And they were not prepared for digging up tiles. But they were willing to do whatever it takes to get their friend to Jesus. I like what it says in verse 19. The beginning of verse 19 says, when they could not find a way. Couldn't find a way? We'll dig up the roof. So here's a question that I think we wrestle with as a church. What do you do when you can't, can't find a way? What do you do when you know you've been given a sacred assignment, but there just doesn't seem to be a way? What do you do when you're called to, to something or someone, and it just seems there's no way? When you knock on the same door, and the door is locked, and the windows are barred, and, and crowds are all around, and, and you can't find a way. You could look back and say, well, well, we tried. We hauled them there that day, and we tried. But the crowds, you know, the crowds, and the people. But every time you see your friend lying on a mat, you'll wonder if you could have tried a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. And you put it off until later, and maybe later may be a better time. But no, that's not it. That's not the time. So, so here's the plan. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be very well thought out, but here's the plan. It's too distracting. It's too impractical. It's too, I don't know, bad for the other people in the house. How are we going to dig through there? And, and, and I'm sure it's going to be embarrassing. For the rest of the time, we're going to be known as the, as the crazy guys on the roof. And it's expensive, I'm sure, because probably somebody's going to have to fix the roof that we tore up. And what if it doesn't work? And, and here, what if Jesus gets mad? Certainly, he doesn't want to be interrupted when he's teaching. So that, so that one person can be helped. What do you do when you can't find a way? I think their plan was great. I think you rip up the roof. I think you rip up the roof. That's what we want to be committed to as a church, that we'll do whatever it takes to get one person to Jesus. And it may be expensive, and it may be unpractical, and we may be improvising, and it might take some, make some of the people who are in the house a little bit uncomfortable. But we need to have a bias for action. There has to be a sense of urgency in the mission we've been given. Because Jesus will soon return, and we don't have time to waste. Folks, ripping up the roof means we need to get to places that are difficult to get. We want to do whatever it takes to get one person to Jesus. Those are the kind of friends we want to be. I just love this story of friends that are so committed to someone who is in need. And isn't that what we should do as a church? When there's a friend in need, to be bringing them to Jesus no matter what. It's pretty easy to see some closed doors and think, that's ah, not an opportunity anymore. Maybe that person needs friends around them that say, wait a minute, what about the roof? What about just being obedient to what God has called us? Let's do that, and we'll get an idea. When I hear this story, that's who I want to be. I want to be one of the friends that will do anything 
it takes to get a friend to Jesus. And, and, yet, and, and yet there are some times I can identify with the crowd. Think about the crowd in this story. They're gathered in the house and they're in the house probably facing the teacher, many spilling out, but they have their backs somewhat to the needs of people, like a paralytic being carried in on a mat. They're in the house taking notes and they're listening and they're teaching and some are there to accuse and they're not concerned about the people getting in the house because they're being taught and fed. And there might be an opportunity where I can accuse. Maybe what really matters to them is their experience in the house. Folks, I think we're being the crowd when the experience in the house gets prioritized over the needs outside the house. When we as a church care more about keeping things intact than restoring lives that have been shattered, it's when as a church we get more excited about the mess that's being made than we get excited about messy people coming to be cleaned up. It's when the church exists for itself and turns its back on folks that don't look like us. I think ripping up the roof means that we will go to great lengths to make sure those outside the house get into Jesus. I imagine what some of those inside the house might have said when they saw the roof being ripped open. Some may have been annoyed because this isn't a good time. Obviously, this isn't a good time. This service is all programmed and Jesus knows what he's talking about. And the guy on the roof isn't part of this program. Some might have said, well, oh, we were here first. And the folks on the roof start digging and dust and dirt are falling. And I wonder if some said, well, now, they're, now they're making a mess. They're making a mess of this house. I'm not going to clean that up. I'm not going to clean that up. I'll go to a different house that isn't quite so messy. Or maybe, maybe they said it's too expensive. Or maybe they said nobody's ever done it that way before. Or maybe they rolled their eyes at what was going on and said, millennials. It's got to be the millennials. And I'm sure they got that idea online. We want to be bold and courageous. We want to be non-conventional and innovative. We want to have a bias for action just to do what God called us to do. And so when the doors are shut and the windows are closed, we hike up on the roof and we do whatever it takes. Many years before we were in the building we're in now, you, many of you remember the Dock Street building in Schuylkillhaven. I think it's a dance studio now. There wasn't much parking there. In our Dock Street Church, we had a lady who visited us in a powered wheelchair. Everybody remember Judy? We had people every Sunday walk several blocks to her to get her in the building to make sure she crossed the street safely. We had steps in front of the building that were impossible for someone in a wheelchair to get up. So we built two portable ramps and set them up every Sunday morning, a group of men, to allow her to get in the building. Once while we were in that building, somebody said to me, are you that church with the wooden ramps? Yeah, I'm kind of proud to be that church with the wooden ramps. The ladies of the church also helped take care of her physical needs, and some of them were very, very physical needs. I just hope we wrecked the roof, we ripped up the roof a little so someone could come. Our new building is handicapped accessible. A few years ago, I read a story and, and uh, heard a story used by a preacher friend of mine. It was about a man named Adam. He met Adam and Adam told him that he had been incarcerated. Adam didn't know how to read or write, but he had a cellmate who became 
and, and uh, who became a Christian while he was in prison. The cellmate told Adam that he would teach him how to read and write in prison. Only catch was they were only going to use the Gospel of Mark. By the time he was released, Adam could not only read and write about Jesus, he was a follower of Jesus. Adam gets out of prison, and he went to a small church in a small town. And when word got out about Adam's crimes, some people in the church were upset that Adam was in their house. One of the prominent families went to the pastor and said, you know, sorry, preacher, but you're going to have to ask Adam to leave or, or we're not comfortable with him or we're going to have to leave. And the pastor explained that Adam was welcome. And then that family left and it looked like some more families were going to leave. On a Sunday morning after the message, the pastor asked Adam to come up in front. The pastor said, the elders and I have made a decision. We've been looking for somebody to keep the building clean and do some minor repairs here at the building. And Adam has some free time as he searches for work. So we're going to ask him to do that. And the pastor, and the pastor reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a key to the building and he hands it to Adam. As Adam told the preacher this story, tears were running down his cheeks. And Adam said, it was the first time in my life that I had ever been given a key to anything. And he felt loved and he felt accepted and he felt the love of God flowing through those folks. Preacher friend that I know who told me Adam's story, he didn't meet Adam speaking at a prison. He met Adam who was, he was the speaker at a pastor's conference. See, Adam had been a pastor of that church for six years. I kind of love that story too. And is it great to see what happens when one at a time people experience the love and the grace of Jesus? Let me finish up our story. Luke 5, verses 26 to 20 to 26. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Now his buddies are leaning down through the hole and, what? No, 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 he's paralyzed. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Ooh, we now have something we can accuse. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Yep. <laughs> yep. Jesus knew what they were thinking and asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven or stay, get up, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up. Take your mat and go home. I want you to see that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So watch what I'm going to do next. Verse 25, immediately the paralyzed guy stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on and went home praising God. I suspect from Jesus' perspective, the inconvenience and, and the hardship of being paralyzed was something he was incredibly passionate towards and sympathetic about. But he also understands in the scheme of things, having your sins forgiven is exponentially more valuable. And he wanted to teach. Not only those were there with good intentions, but those who were there with not so good intentions. Verse 25, immediately he, the paralyzed man, stood up in front of them, took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things here today. <laughs> remarkable things? I think that's an understatement. <laughs> I wish I could have been there. And I love that Jesus told him to go home. 
And I think I know why. Because Jesus knows about this man and he knows who's waiting for him at home. And he knows how much fun it's going to be when he walks through the door and says, Mom and Dad, God isn't mad at us. It's not because anything you did. It's not because of anything I did that I'm lying, that I was lying on this mat. You're not going to believe when I tell you this story and what happened today. And I think the celebration begins. Yeah, I read that story and I think to myself, what would it have been like to be there? And I find myself wondering, how can I be a part of stories like that? Can I love that kind of love? Am I someone who is willing to be bold, to take risks, to think outside the box, maybe way outside the box, to rip up the roof, to get somebody to Jesus? And it might mean doing some it in some unconventional ways. And I ask, is this that kind of church where somebody will rip up the roof to get me to Jesus? Somewhere where I can see people who have been paralyzed by guilt and shame and fear and to get them in front of Jesus to be healed. I think we are. I think we're that church. And I just look forward to being part of the next story that all of us really love. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this story in Luke's gospel. Thank you for what it teaches us. Thank you for fanatical friends that hope and faith and love, big, big kind of love. The kind of love that rips up the roof to get someone healed. My God, it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.